Hi, welcome back to Philosophy 101. I'm Chris Ann Moore, and this is Episode 6, Part 2 of The Buddha. So today we're going to go over some of the information that we covered last time on Buddhism, and then we're going to finish off that chapter and go over our student learning outcomes. But before we do that, what I want to do is remind you of a few things. We're on Chapter 6 now. That means that you should have read by now on your web chapters, Why Study Philosophy, Inadequate Answers, The Best Possible Answers, The Beginning, Lao Tzu, and Buddha. You should also have completed the study questions at the back of each of those chapters. And of course, you should be participating in discussions and uh, putting your assignments on the discussion board. So reread your syllabus. Make sure you're ca caught up. It's very easy to fall behind in a distance ed course, so don't let that happen to you, OK? All right, so let's go on to the Buddha. As I was saying last episode, Buddha lived from 560 to 480 BC and was born in Nepal, in what is now India. Now, the Buddha was born to a very wealthy family. He was the son of a prince, and his parents had decided to protect him. In fact, they didn't want him to expose to any kind of suffering at all, and so they confined him to the estate. In fact, they built a wall around the estate, and he was not allowed to leave. But of course, when Buddha became a teenager, he went over the wall. And when he got into the city, he was shocked but what, by what he found there. Because for the first time in his life, Siddhartha, as he was called then, saw disease. He saw old age. He saw death. And this shocked Siddhartha far more than it might any of us. And surely it hurts any of us to see those things. But Siddhartha had been, up until that point, unaware that they existed. And suddenly, he was confronted with the great existential question, how does one live in the face of inevitable suffering? Because he realized that, of course, death is inevitable. Disease actually is unavoidable. Old age is unavoidable if one is even lucky enough to live that long. And even if in the moment you are not personally suffering, there's suffering all around you all the time. So how does one live in the face of that suffering. On top of that, Siddhartha realized that his protected life in the palace had not brought him happiness. In fact, having every single one of his desires indulged had left him discontent and unsatisfied. In fact, Siddhartha came to the realization that life was, in fact, unsatisfactory. And then one day, in one of his excursions into the city, Siddhartha met an ascetic monk. Now, as we learned last time, an ascetic is one who limits all sensual desire, all desire of the body, in order to maintain control and hopefully to achieve enlightenment. Well, Siddhartha looked into the eyes of this ascetic monk, and there he saw peace and contentment. And he thought to himself, I want that. And so Siddhartha began on a spiritual journey that was going to last many, many years in search of the peace and contentment in that monk's eyes. And Siddhartha tried himself asceticism. In fact, he was so accomplished at controlling his body that it is said at one point you could touch his stomach and you would feel his spine. But for all that control, Siddhartha had not gained enlightenment. And so he came to the realization that enlightenment was not to be gained by the control of the body. That, in fact, with the body, a middle way is best. One should neither deny the body, nor should one indulge the body. And Siddhartha realized there must be another way to achieve enlightenment. And so one day, he sat down under a Bodhi tree by a river, and he determined that he would sit there until he had gotten the answer that he was looking for. And so Siddhartha went into meditation, and for 49 days and 49 nights he meditated. And then, on the 49th day, Siddhartha achieved enlightenment and then became the Buddha, or the Enlightened One. And in this enlightenment, Siddhartha realized another, a completely other consciousness, a consciousness which is so other from that of the limited labeling, categorizing, judging, desiring, wanting, manipulating, ego mind, that mind that we talked about in the episode on Lao and that mind we talked about last time, it is so other from that mind that, in fact, Siddhartha was incapable of 
putting that experience into the words or the labels that could communicate it to the ego mind. The closest he could come is to say that it is beyond words, that there's no I, there's no separation, but most of all, there's no suffering. Nirvana is a state of bliss in which there is no consciousness of separation and which there is no suffering. And of course, at that moment, the Buddha had a decision to make. He had to decide whether to stay in this blissful state a return to a consciousness of the normal world, the consciousness of the world we all live in, and help others to escape from that suffering now that he knew the way. And it is said that all the world shook while Buddha was making his decision. And of course, we know the decision the Buddha made. He returned to teach others how to escape suffering. Now, as we begin to look at those teachings of Buddha, must realize that the teachings of Buddha have given rise to enormous numbers of philosophies and different religions and different sects within religions. There are different writings on the teachings of Buddha, there are different interpretations, and there are different practices. What we're going to look at here is just the basic philosophy of Buddhism. We're going to touch on a few points, and hopefully by touching on some essential points, that will arise your curiosity, and you can go out and read more about the Buddha on your own because it is a fascinating philosophy and a fascinating religion. Now, one of the most fascinating things actually is what Buddha decided not to teach. Buddha didn't try to answer questions like when did the world begin or how did we get there or why do we suffer or how did evil come into the world. As a matter of fact, Buddha called these questions not tending to edification. In other words, it didn't matter. What mattered is that we were suffering. And like someone who's been pierced with an arrow, you don't say, where's this arrow made? Who shot this arrow? You say instead, pull the arrow out. And so that is what Buddha attempted to do, to teach human beings to end their suffering, to pull the metaphorical arrow out of their souls, that they too might attain a consciousness where there is no suffering, a consciousness where there is bliss. The very center of that teaching is the Four Noble Truths, as we talked about last time. The first truth, life is suffering. The second truth, suffering is caused by ego-centered desire. It is caused by those desires that arise from that labeling, categorizing, judging, desiring mind, that wanting, wanting, stri striving, struggling, manipulating mind. That is the cause of the unsatisfactoriness, the suffering of life. And so, the good news becomes a third noble truth. Suffering can be ended. And the fourth, Buddha tells us how to end suffering. And suffering is ended by the eightfold path. Now, just briefly, as I said last time, in order to understand the eightfold path, we have to understand some of the basic concepts of Buddhism. Fundamental to an understanding of Buddhism is, fun is an understanding of karma. And karma is the very simple idea it's called the law of moral causation, which is simply what goes around, comes around. If you lie, you're going to be lied to. If you cheat, you're going to be cheated. If you hate, you're going to be hated. If you love, you're going to be loved. If you forgive, you're going to be forgiven. So karma, the law of moral causation. And second essential concept to understanding Buddhism is understanding the concept of reincarnation. The idea that we are born, we live, we die, and then we are born again. As another being, we live once more and die once more and are born again. Now in Buddhism, it is understood that this cycle of reincarnation, we continuously reincarnate into a reality of suffering. And therefore, one of the goals of Buddhism is to escape this cycle of reincarnation, to escape suffering, to remain in a consciousness of bliss. And another goal of Buddhism is, of course, to achieve nirvana. There are some Buddhist schools that believe nirvana is only achieved after death, when the cycle of reincarnation is ended. There are other Buddhist schools, however, that believe that nirvana is possible during life. Just as Buddha achieved nirvana while he was alive, anyone can achieve enlightenment while they are alive. That it can happen in a moment, in fact. 
And therefore, the Eightfold Path, using these basic concepts of karma and reincarnation, sets out a method by which one can escape the cycle of reincarnation and one can achieve nirvana in this lifetime. So, now we're going to begin looking once more at the Eightfold Path. And the first precept of the Eightfold Path is right understanding. Right understanding is simply coming to the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. That is, in order to even begin to head towards nirvana or begin to end the cycle of reincarnation, one first must realize that the Four Noble Truths are indeed true. It's the very basics. For instance, the first noble truth, life is suffering. A lot of people don't believe that life is suffering. Or if they think life is suffering, they think they're suffering right now, but it's going to be better tomorrow. Or just around the bend. Or next year when I get out of school. Or the year after that when I get a great job. Or the year after that when I buy a home. Or the year after that when I get married. Or the year after that when I have children. Or when my children are finally grown and I'm alone and I have peace again. See, most people think that happiness is possible in this world, that happiness is possible through this consciousness, that actually happiness is possible through the fulfillment of desire. And although they may be suffering right now, that that suffering will be ended, that suffering can actually be escaped. As a matter of fact, we live in a country which is based on the Declaration of Independence, which declares pursuit of happiness as a fundamental right. But many Americans don't realize that there is a huge gap between pursuit of happiness and achievement of happiness. Pursuit of happiness, achievement of happiness. And most Americans, like most people all over the world actually, think that this gap is closed by pursuing desires. That happiness is pursued by pursuing desire. And when desire is achieved, happiness is achieved. Unless, Buddha would say that unless you realize that this path is suffering and offers nothing but suffering. You cannot even begin to seek nirvana. You can't even begin to want to transcend the cycle of reincarnation. As long as you believe that your manipulating, striving, struggling ego mind is going to get you happiness, you, can't, you won't even start on the path. Life is suffering because of desire. And that is the second noble truth. Suffering is caused by ego-centered desire. Now, ego-centered is important because there are many things that inspire us. In fact, we may be inspired to seek nirvana. But the wanting, willing, manipulating, striving that comes from the ego mind is the cause of suffering. Let's look at the nature of desire. First of all, we have desires that we can't ever satisfy. I want to win a hundred million dollars in the lottery. Don't you? Doesn't that set you up? I want a beach house in the Hamptons. I want the perfect lover. Of course, the perfect lover doesn't exist. Very few people get a beach house in the Hamptons. And winning the lottery, well, your chances are less than being struck by lightning. So we get caught in these desires, first of all, that we can't satisfy. This wanting. And then, of course, there are those desires that we can satisfy. But there is this amazing thing about human nature that as soon as we have a desire, a satisfied desire, as soon as we get what we think we want, we don't want it anymore. Or we appreciate it for a moment, as I talked about in the episode on Lousy with my beautiful TV armoire. I was so happy to finally pay for it and have it all set up, and I stood back and I said, oh, it needs a rug. I didn't even enjoy it for a second. And if you look at your own life, as you satisfy your desires, think how much you actually appreciate it once it's satisfied. Isn't it true that every satisfied desire gives birth to ten more desires? In the littlest thing, I, I want an ice cream cone. Oh, so sweet and so good. Oh, my mouth is sticky. I need something salty. It gets, oh, I need some water. Oh, I need to. And it's need and want and want and want and want. Rarely is this moment of, this is it. 
the satisfied desire. So even satisfaction of desire doesn't bring an end to suffering. And then there's the third problem with desire, which is once the desire is satisfied, we become attached to the things that we've earned. We become attached to the things that we possess. We become attached actually to the things that we think we are. But as soon as we have something, the truth is there is no love without grief, there is no life without death, and there is no material possession that is not subject to loss and to decay. And to the extent that we become attached to those things we have desired and achieved, we're bound to become miserable. Because everything decays, everything changes, everything evolves. Everything eventually goes away. In the littlest things, I just paid off my car. Huge accomplishment. I finally sent in that last check and I got my car title and no more car payment. And it was not a week. Got in my car and I'm driving and squeak the brakes. I know everybody says that as soon as you pay your car, it starts to fall apart. So now I have several hundred dollars I'm going to pay for a brake job. But if I was attached to that, I'm bound to be miserable. Am I surprised that my brakes are going? Everybody's brakes go. As a matter of fact, everybody says that as soon as you pay off your car, it starts to break down and you have to pay for it. So why should I be miserable? Why should I suffer over that? Now that is a small event, rather insignificant event, although to some it might seem torturous. But then go to the larger events, the really hurtful events of our lives, the events of losing loved ones, the events of watching our own body betray us. Age is unavoidable. I've noticed all of a sudden, I, you know, I am reading out here. I didn't think it could actually happen to me. I knew everybody else had to get glasses over 40, but I didn't think it was going to actually happen to me. So the extent that we get attached to things in a world of inve inevitable loss and change and transformation, we are miserable unavoidably miserable as long as we remain convinced that we can make it here and we can make it with our manipulations. And interestingly enough, well, you know what we become most attached to? Our own self-image. We become most attached to this idea of ourselves that we have. And we become very attached to everybody else having this idea of us. The thing is, is we fight and we strive and we struggle for this self-image, this image of success, this image of pride, this image of popularity, this image of being liked by everybody, this image of being the athlete. Whatever image it is that you are striving for yourself, you become attached. And you become attached to what other people think about that image. And that is one of the primary sources of misery. Because first of all, you can't control what anybody else thinks of you. So to the extent you're invested in that, you've set yourself up for suffering. But even to become attached to your own self-image is ridiculous. Because as the Buddha will point out, when you reach nirvana, there's no self. I know, we can't comprehend that. The ego mind won't understand that. But just to think about it for a moment. In nirvana, where there is no suffering, there is no self. So. All of that is right understanding, to understand that life is suffering, to understand that suffering is caused by ego-centered desire, because that leads to the third, that suffering can be ended by the Eightfold Path. So right understanding leads directly to the second precept of the Eightfold Path, which is right purpose. Because once you understand that life is suffering, once you understand the cause of that suffering, then your purpose can be to end that suffering. Your purpose can be to escape the cycle of reincarnation to achieve nirvana. Until you get that, you can't start out. But now you have the right purpose. All right, you have understanding and purpose. How do you achieve that purpose? Well, the next three precepts of the Eightfold Path are really about morality. Right speech, right conduct, and the last of that, right livelihood. Right speech, right effort right livelihood. Now, volumes have been written about 
each of these, what right speech really refers to, what right livelihood is, what right conduct is. But an understanding of these can be simplified by an understanding of karma. Since what you put out is what comes back to you, every time you harm another in any way, who do you harm? You harm yourself. And so really, right speech, right conduct, and right livelihood is about think, speaking, acting, and making your living in a way that harms no one. And in fact, it goes farther than that. It's harming nothing. Because Buddhism, unlike many Western ethics, includes animals and plants and all beings into consideration. And therefore, one must, if one is to achieve nirvana, or if one is to escape the cycle of reincarnation and end suffering, one must not harm. In fact, the understanding is every time you commit a harm, you chain yourself. You lie, you chain yourself to this life. You cheat, you chain yourself to this life. You slander, you chain yourself to this life. You condemn, you chain yourself to this life. Each of the harms that you commit on anyone else, you are chaining yourself to this level of consciousness. Not only are you chaining yourself to this level of consciousness, you are assuring that it's going to come back to you. You are assuring that somebody's going to slander you. You are assuring that somebody's going to manipulate you. You are assuring that somebody's going to be condemning you. So, the three precepts, these three precepts of the Eightfold Path is about not harming. Simple harmlessness is what it comes down to. And of course, the other side of harm, harmlessness is helpfulness. One stops harming and becomes instead helpful. And only by that kind of moral righteousness can one hope to, achieve, to escape from suffering. All right. Next on the Eightfold Path, right effort. Right effort simply means that each of your efforts needs to be directed at the attainment of harmlessness, helpfulness, and the achievement of nirvana. You have the right purpose, now you must make your efforts and all of your efforts into that direction. All right, then comes right mindfulness. Mindfulness. If you remember at the beginning of the episode on Lao Tzu, I asked you to become aware of your awareness. I asked you to close your eyes and to watch your own thoughts. And as we discussed, as if you watch these thoughts, you came to the realization that a great many of these thoughts are negative. We explored the mind. And we saw what the mind does with experience, um, that first it separates, and then it labels and categorizes, and then it judges. We began to look at the nature of the mind, which is a form of mindfulness, to know the nature of the mind. Another form of mindfulness is to come to that realization that this mind that's chattering away all day long, this mind that is our primary experience of ourself, is actually extraordinarily negative. And in Buddhism, karma is not just a matter of what we do or what we say or how we make a living. Karma is also about how we think. Our very thoughts create karma, not just what we do. In the Dharmapada, Buddha wrote, A man who has good thoughts, goodness shall follow him as the wheels of the cart follow the ox. A man who thinks bad thoughts, evil shall follow him as the wheels of the cart follow the ox. So your very thoughts create karma. Your very thoughts create the nature of your existence and your very thoughts determine whether you can reach nirvana or not. And so you need to become aware of those thoughts because not until you become aware of your mind, not until you listen to this chattering instead of just letting it go on, will you come to the realization that it's critical and judgmental and fearful and that it's dragging you down. But once you become aware, once you have that mindfulness, then you can begin to intercede in those thoughts. But there's something else that mindfulness means as well. Mindfulness is just is not only being aware of your awareness or conscious of your consciousness. Mindfulness is also being present. Being mindful 
of what is occurring at the moment. Because as we discussed, the mind, the chattering mind, is talking about the past or it's talking about the future. It's resenting, regretting, missing the past, or it's worrying about the future and how it's going to pay bills or if it's going to keep its job. Or The chattering mind is in the past or the future. Mindfulness is presence. Mindfulness is being aware of now. If, in other words, if you're eating a peach, as one great teacher would say, you eat that peach. You taste those juices. You feel this crisp skin break under your teeth. You feel the juices running down. You are fully present to the moment. That's a form of mindfulness. And as you attempt to become mindful, what you become aware of, aware of is that quite often you are not present. Quite often you are not mindful of the now, but you are lost in this mind somewhere in the past or somewhere in the future. Just as a very simple of it, example of this, have you ever driven home and then wondered how you got home? You think it was just you, huh? It's everybody. You get behind the wheel of the car and you start thinking about something and all of a sudden you're in your driveway. That is the lack of mindfulness. You are not present to what you were doing. And actually think about it, it's quite a miracle we get home because this happens all the time and it's not just you. So next time you're beeping away at somebody and you think they've spaced out in their car, realize, yes, they have. They've spaced out in their car. So mindfulness is beginning to break that negative thinking and to become present to your experience. Now, the last step in the Eightfold Path, the eighth, pre the eighth precept, is right meditation. Right meditation is a mind practice of calming the mind and breaking through the illusion of this consciousness and achieving a wholly other consciousness, achieving indeed enlightenment. Now, right meditation generally takes the teacher because it is extremely easy to get caught in the delusions and confusions of our own mind. And therefore, to try to uh, do a meditate, many people do a meditative practice on their own. However, if you're interested in a meditative practice, it's a very good idea to do some reading, and it's even a better idea to have a teacher because there are many pitfalls. Once one starts working with their own mind, uh, the subconscious tends to uh, activate, and some interesting things can come up for you to deal with. Also, it can, you can become confused about when you're on the right meditative path and when you've strayed off into uh, delusions of grandeur. So a teacher is necessary for the, la the last path. So that is the Eightfold Path. That is how suffering is transcended. Right understanding, right purpose, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness. And that gives us the center of Buddhist ethics. And the center of Buddhist ethics is the essence of Buddhist ethics is harmlessness and helpfulness. Very clear, very simple. What is the good in Buddhism? The good is harmlessness. The good is helpfulness. Why be good? What is the justification for the good? Well, the justification for the good, why be good? Because the only way that you can escape suffering. See, Buddhism locates morality next to happiness. In fact, morality and happiness are intimately intertwined, as they are in most great thinkers. You find this in Lao Tzu, you'll find this in Buddha, we'll find this in Socrates, in Plato, in Aristotle, in many of the greatest thinkers, being harmless, being moral, is the pursuit of happiness. Now, of course, the reasoning in Buddhism is based on this experience of nirvana. So, let us think how we can begin to understand this state of desirelessness. Because, really, the Eightfold Path is deceptively simple. However, as Gandhi once said, the truth is as simple as it is difficult. The Eightfold Path present, presents enormous difficulties when one actually tries to live by it. And for many people in the West, actually, one of the biggest difficulties with the Eightfold Path is really understanding what it means to release will and desire. 
so much of Western culture and Western civilization is based on a celebration of desire, a celebration of will. It's kind of the Rocky mentality. It's you're down and out and you have an obstacle, but you have this tremendous desire. Because of this tremendous desire, you're willing to take on all obstacles. And so when we begin to talk about letting go of desire, st students begin to look at me a little cross-eyed. A lot of times they think, yeah, right. If I let go of desire, I'm not going to be in this class because the only reason I'm at school is because I desire to graduate. And I desire to graduate because I want a better job. It is my desires that keep me tuned into your program. So how can we begin to understand? We've looked at once in Laosu, how is harmony with the Tao achieved? Harmony with the Tao is achieved by stop willing, stop wanting, stop desiring. In Buddhism, how is nirvana achieved? Stop willing, stop manipulating, stop desiring, stop being attached. Now, of course, Buddha gives us a step-by-step -step plan on how to do that. But how do we begin to understand that? There was an episode, I don't know, have you ever seen Xena, Warrior Princess? Oh, don't lie, yes, you have. Well, there's an episode in Xena, Warrior Princess where Xena goes to China. And uh, she runs into a sage, a Taoist sage, Lao Ma. And this isn't Xena's bad period. Xena's a warrior and a conqueror. And Lao Ma is teaching Xena. Lao Ma's a Taoist. And at one point, Lao Ma takes a vase and puts it on a table. And Lao Master just stands back and looks at the vase, and the vase shatters into a million pieces. And Zena's like, cool, how do you do that? So Lao Ma takes a vase and puts it on the table and has Zena go ahead and try. And so Zena takes her position, and of course she looks at this vase. She's struggling. Nothing's happening. So you see every muscle begins to tense and Lao Ma, of course, laughs. And Zena gets mad and says, why, are you laughing at me? And Lao Ma says, you are trying to will the vase apart. And Zena says, well, yes, what else is there? Now, that is the same thing that the vast majority of us would say, what else is there if there isn't will? And Lao Ma's answer is actually a famous Taoist saying. Lao Ma says, the entire world is driven by a will, blind and ruthless. In order to transcend the world, in order to transcend the limitations of the world, you need to stop willing, stop desiring, stop hating. So what else is there? Well, interestingly enough, one of the... Um, easiest ways for students to understand this not willing is what I discussed in the episode on Lao Tzu, which is that there are moments, great athletic moments, in which the mind is stopped and everything happens perfectly. Every shot goes in. You're always where the ball is. It's working perfectly until you think, ah, it's working perfectly, and then it stops. Or that moment when you hit the perfect wave. Because, of course, you can't calculate the perfect wave through the ego mind, but you hit the perfect wave. It's a moment of no mind. Great performances, great athletics, great surfing. There are moments of no mind. But another way to understand this idea of not willing actually is to look at Western religion. And since many of my students are Christian, or at least aware of the um, teachings of Christianity, they can begin to understand not willing because that same idea from a different angle exists in Christianity. For instance, if you think, what is the one prayer that Jesus said to pray if one is only going to pray one prayer? The Our Father. The Our Father says, Our Father, who art in heaven, holy be thy names thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Whose will? Thy will. Not my will, thy will. So how does one pray? By sacrificing one's will. How does one 
to come in relationship to the divine by sacrificing one's own will. Now, of course, although Buddhism and Taoism both talk about sacrificing will, they're talking about it in a different sense. To Lao Tzu, when you sacrifice will, you, are, you will become one with the Tao. You'll enter Wu Wei and all action will be perfect, harmonious, and spontaneous. In Buddhism, when one sacrifices will and desiring, one becomes capable of achieving nirvana, a consciousness of bliss. And in Christianity, when one sacrifices will, it is to allow the will of a personal divine being to come through one. So there are differences, and yet we do find the similarity of the idea of letting go of personal will. As a matter of fact, if probably the most stunning moment in the Gospels is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he knows he is going to be crucified the next day. Because what is that moment really about? Jesus says, take this cup from my lips. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through this. I don't want to be crucified. But where does he come to by the end? But thy will be done, not my will. This idea of suspension of personal will is found throughout the Christian doctrine. And actually, it only makes logical sense if you think about it. I mean, imagine if you were in relationship to an omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, and all-loving being, would you tell that being what should be done? I mean, really, think about it. Let's say God comes over for the day, and you have a conversation. Would you spend your conversation with God telling God what you think should be done? Now, if you believe in this being, and you believe this being is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving, do you really think that it, you need to give it directions, him, her, directions? You say, listen, this is how I think you should solve the problems in the Middle East, okay? That would be ludicrous. Or, this is how I think my life should work out. Well, first of all, I want that $100 million lottery. Secondly, I want the beach and the... Ha that, of course, would be ludicrous. It's simple sense, if one believes in an all-powerful, omniscient being, that one wouldn't take it upon themselves to say, this is what I think you should do. Imagine, imagine you have a relative coming to visit you in Hawaii. Would you pray, if you were Christian, that that relative make it onto the plane? Of course not. You don't know if that plane's going to go down. You don't know what's going to happen to that plane. Doesn't it make a great, more deal, a great more sense if you believe in this God to say your will be done on this trip? Well, the same thing applies to other aspects of life if one is a Christian. That one should suspend one's personal will and thereby no divine will. So this idea of stop willing, stop desiring, stop manipulating, we find in, in the three major, three of the major religions, Buddhism, Taoism, and Christianity. Now, of course, just as a caveat in the Christian tradition, for those of you who are Christian, you do realize there's something called the mystery of prayer, which is, of course, you are allowed to, or even expected to, to ask God for what you want. This is a mystery, of course, because why would one have to tell an all-knowing, all-powerful God what you want? Well, that's free will. That's accounted for by free will. That God may know what you want, but cannot give it to you without you asking, because that would be a limitation on your free will. So that's part of the mystery of prayer. However, even though you are allowed to ask for what you want, you are still supposed to end each prayer with, if it be thy will, not my will, thy will. So... As I said, in Buddhism, in Taoism, in Christianity, although very different in some ways, this idea of the suspension of personal will is found. Interestingly enough, this idea of um, the problem of willing from the ego mind is also found in folk tales from all over the world. There are, there are tales in almost every single culture in which someone is given three wishes. And in every single case, the last wish is the same which is they wish it never happened. 
let's think of the, uh, the story of Midas. I'm sure you've heard the story of Midas. This is uh, the king in ancient Greece, of course. Now, Midas was only given one wish. But Midas wished that everything he touched would turn to gold. Seemed like a good idea at first. But then, of course, Midas went to drink, and the liquid turned to gold, and he remained thirsty. And Midas went to eat, and his food turned to gold, and he starved. And then finally, Midas' son comes running into the room, and he throws his arms around him, and he turns his son to gold and kills him. Now, this story is often thought to be a story about greed, and it certainly is on some level. But it's also a story about willing from the ego mind. Because when the ego mind desires and gets what it wills, there's trouble, often. Because the ego mind is extremely limited in its knowing. The ego mind cannot possibly calculate the consequences of every action. And as you know, every single action has innumerable consequences that ripple out from it in all sorts of directions. So when one gets what one wants, watch out. That's where that saying comes from. Watch out, you might get what you ask for. Because we can't think of all those consequences. Often what we most desire, what we think we want most, is disastrous. Ever fall in love with the wrong person and just want that relationship so badly? And then you got that relationship and you're like, how do I get out of this relationship? There's another story actually that illustrates this really well. It's um, Edgar Allan Poe. You might have heard this story. It's a very famous story. It's called The Monkey's Paw. It's another one of those three wishes stories. The Monkey's Paw. An old couple is given a monkey's paw and they are told that they're they have three wishes, the traditional three wishes. The old couple pulls out the monkey's claw, and they're really quite nervous about this. And they don't want to be greedy. They don't want to be like Midas. They heard the story, and they realize that, oh, we just need $10,000. With $10,000, we can pay our bills, and we'll have a little set aside for ourselves, and that won't be greedy. So they pull out the monkey's paw, and they make a wish. $10,000, please. And they put the paw away, and they wait. And a little while later, the phone rings. And they pick up the phone. They find out their son has been killed at work. And of course, his insurance policy is worth $10,000. So they think, what have we done? And the old couple look all around. They pull out the monkey's claw, and they think, oh, we've made such a mistake. We just want our son back. Just send us our son back. And they put the claw away, and they wait. And that night, they hear footsteps, boom, 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 and scratching at their door. And they realize that they have raised their son from the dead. This is, after all, an Edgar Allan Poe story. And of course, the old couple run downstairs, and they look all around the house, and they're looking for the monkey's claw, and they finally pick up the monkey's claw, and they make the wish that everybody makes as the third wish in folk tales around the world. We just want things back the way they were before we got this monkey's claw. The realization, of course, that they were better off before their ego mind wishes were fulfilled. So, we can understand this stop desiring, stop willing, stop wanting in many ways. In one way from that athletic moment of no mind when everything's perfect. In another way from understanding if you have faith, and that's your personal decision, in something bigger than yourself, whether it's called the Tao or Nirvana or a supreme being in relationship, that there may be, there is, if you have that faith, something else beside your will, which is better. And then, again, from understanding that the wanting ego mind is incredibly limited in its knowledge, and therefore, watch out. You may get what you ask for. Interestingly, this idea as well, not only do we find this idea of suspension of personal will throughout the world and in many of the major religions, because you will find that again in the Judeo- the, uh, the Jewish tradition, and it will be again in the Islamic tradition, the suspension of personal will. But this idea of karma is found again and again all over the world. 
Karma is found, of course, in the, tr in the Christian tradition as well. Many of the sayings of the New Testament can be interpreted as speaking of karma. Indeed, Jesus says, as you sow, so shall you reap. This is an expression, of course, of karma. What you put out is what you're going to get back. It is also written, you shall know a tree by its fruits. In other words, what you shall produce shall be a reflection of what you are. Karma. And actually, Jesus goes so far as, like Buddha, to say that your karma, or what's coming back to you, of course, Jesus does not use the word karma, but the concept is extremely similar, that not only is it about what you do, but it is also in Christianity about what you think. Jesus, in the Bible, Jesus says, you have heard it said that the man who commits adultery has sinned, but I say to you, the man who thinks of committing adultery has sinned. Wow. That's a whole other level of having to watch out. Not only what you say, not only the actions you take, but what you think. Again, we find a similarity to Buddhism in this idea that what you put out is what comes back to you. Not only, as in Christianity, the judgment, life after death, heaven or something else, but in your life, that you will reap what you sow, that you shall bear the fruit of your own actions, and that what you think itself determines whether you have sinned or not. So. This is another similarity we find in many of the great traditions, and we certainly find it in Buddhism and Christianity, and in Hinduism, as a matter of fact. And interestingly enough, we will find it in the teachings of Socrates as well, when we look at the Western philosophical tradition. Because although the Western tradition will be extremely, the Western philosophical tradition will be very different from Western religion and Asian philosophy in that a great deal of the Western philosophical tradition will be, will seek to organize mind, will seek to uh, clarify the labeling, categorizing mind, and will actually find the good within human desire and in the pursuit of human desire. The father of Western philosophy, Socrates, will actually have many ideas in common with Buddhism and Taoism. Socrates, too, will believe in reincarnation. Socrates will say that when you harm others, you harm yourself most. Socrates says, also believes in the suspension of personal will. Socrates writes, not didn't write, Socrates said, it was written down by Plato, I pray for only those gifts the gods would give, for only the gods know what gifts are best. Socrates also believed in the limits of human wisdom. So we have this idea of reincarnation. We have this idea of harming yourself when you harm others. We have this idea of suspension of personal will, all carried into the very basis of Western philosophy, because all Western philosophers will look to Socrates to, uh, we'll look back at Socrates as setting the foundation of Western philosophy. So let's look at uh, some of our student learning outcomes for this episode on Buddhism. From this episode, you should be able to describe the four signs, asceticism, the middle path, nirvana, and bodhisattva. You should be able to describe the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, Karma, and Reincarnation. You should also be able to describe some similarities between Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity. You should also be able to describe at least one essential difference between Buddhism, Taoism, and Christianity. And you should also be able to talk about the questions that Buddha would not answer. Okay, so the questions Buddha would not answer, um, that indeed Buddha didn't think it was important to uh, figure out why we're here or how evil and suffering began are many of the questions that will later dominate Western thinking. All right, you should also know the essential elements of Buddhist ethics as well as the justification for the good in Buddhist ethics.
I'm going to take the little few minutes at the end of this episode now to go over some of the key points that we have covered thus far. As I said at the beginning of this episode, it's extremely important that you are reading your chapters on the web, that at the end of each chapter that you are indeed completing your study questions because, of course, at least half of your exam will be based on those study questions at the end of the chapter, and that if you are, of course, handing in your assignments and participating in ethical deliberation on the discussion board of the website. So let's think about where we began just six episodes ago and where we have come. And we're going to do that quickly because we only have about five minutes here. From the beginning, we discovered that philosophy is the love of wisdom, and that, of course, wisdom is knowledge of how to live the best of all possible lives and being able to live it consistently. We came to the recognition that, of course, once one begins on this path to wisdom, that all these questions spill out. Why am I here? What am I doing? What is my meaning and purpose? Why does it hurt? What should I do? And then, of course, we are in this course only dealing with one small portion of all of those questions that are in philosophy. And that small question really is the essential question of how ought I live? This is a question of morality. Morality, of course, deals with correct behavior to other beings, between what is right and what is wrong, what is considered good and what is considered evil. Now, to answer, to begin to discover what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, one must use, of course, ethical reasoning. One must have a way to begin to approach those answers, whether you are trying to decide whether to return a wallet that you found that has a driver's license, or whether you are trying to decide that whether or not gay marriage should be legalized. Not only do you have to know what you think is right and wrong, you have to know the reasoning behind what you think is right and wrong. Otherwise, your answer is empty, really. It's just opinion. It's just mere belief. And it's uh, not going to garner the respect of, respect of philosophers, that's for sure. We also discovered as we looked at these questions that uh, over all this time of philosophy, in all these different places that there are no definitive answers to philosophical questions. That in other words, that of all the answers that have been put forward over the ages, there are none that can be undoubtedly proven to be true. Now, this is stunning in one way because, of course, you buy a lawnmower, you get a manual. But you get a baby naked and howling in the world, no directions, no answers. But of course, the fact that there are no answers is really kind of fabulous because the fact that there are no answers allows you to strive and struggle for your own answers, which is what most of you say you want to do. The fact that there are no definitive answers allows you to do that conscious, creative confrontation with the mystery of life, which is the essence of life itself, and to come up with your own answers, which is stunning, which is wonderful, which is beautiful, which is frustrating, which is annoying, which is hard. But importantly, although there are no definitive answers to philosophical questions, philosophers do for the most part agree that some answers are better than others. That although we can't be absolutely sure of one answer, we can be pretty sure when some answers can be eliminated. And we can be pretty sure of what answers are worth considering at all. And what are considered answers worth listening to, what are considered answers that are worth considering, are answers that are derived by a specific method. And in philosophy, that method is reasoning. Now, as I said before, in your own life, you can use eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You can use rock, paper, scissors. But in philosophy, good answers are differentiated from bad answers by the reasoning that is used to arrive at that answer. And we can determine what is good and bad reasoning. And what is good and bad reasoning determines good or bad grades in this class. So it's well worth knowing what is good and bad reasoning. Now, in the second episode, we looked at those answers that are simply inadequate. Those answers that do not provide good reasoning. I was raised that way. Inadequate answer. You need to have your own reasoning at this point in your life. It's my tradition. Inadequate answer. Some traditions are good and should be preserved. Other traditions need to be thrown out. You don't keep something just because it's tradition. You've got to find the reasons for it being a tradition and then decide based on those reasonings if the tradition should be preserved or not. Hula is a beautiful tradition and should be preserved. Slavery, 
was a horrible tradition and needed to be eliminated and made illegal. Which leads us to the third. It's the law is not a reason. Legality is not morality. In fact, you must use your morality to judge what laws to vote on, to judge what laws to protest and resist. And, of course, God said so is not an answer. So, as you are developing your reasoning, you need to look at what we talked about in Episode 3, inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, feelings, intuitions, maybe visions, but you need to put them through the tests of truth. And so, as you go through your assignments, let's, let's look at really good reasoning. And uh, remember to do those chapters. Remember to do those study questions. And I will see you next time when we will begin Western philosophy. Good night. Have a great night. See you next time.